Today's episode brought to you in part by Squarespace, website creation and development platform. Today, we are going to pick up where we left off in the last episode, which is where we start to replace our old electronic system with our new electronic system. And you'll remember, this is our new Axiom 9 inch, which is gonna be part one of our big jigsaw puzzle that we are gonna start installing today. We started last time, but today we're gonna to continue on, get it hooked up, and start doing a little testing and show you a little bit of how it works. So, stick around, because today, my friends, you're gonna learn something. Me too. First thing I need to do before we install the new is get rid of the old. So this is our old dragonfly system that used to be my backup system. But now we have new backups on our backups. You know I like that. So we remove all the old stuff and make room for new. Okay. Part two, getting rid of the old. Now this, this is our backbone connection for the Raymarine system. We're not gonna use this white cord because now we have a new one that comes with the new system that goes to the adapter for the new Axiom nine inch. We are gonna use the backbone here to this single end splice. So that's gonna stay intact. We're not gonna open that. This is just something that joins the Axiom to over here where the other instruments are. So all the navs, like the weather station and all that kind of stuff, the weather instruments at the masthead, the depth sounder, all of that, are all linked through this cable. So that will come next and we've isolated, we've gotten rid of just about everything here now. Basically getting rid of everything we're not using. And that leaves us just with the power cable that comes from the boat, which is this guy. So that's our 12 volt power source for the whole system over here. So we're just gonna splice into this when we're ready and hook up the new display. And getting back to the Axiom itself, we're gonna look on the back and you're gonna see basically we've got four big connection points on the back of it. The main one we're looking at today is gonna be this one right here. That is the primary connection point for our power hookup. So that's our power and also our interface to our Raymarine network, the basic interface. So that's this cable right here. Now you see this cable has two components, okay? We have the power wire itself. So we basically just have a power positive, a negative, and a shield. And then we have this adapter here, and this is for the CTOC connections to the rest of the Raymarine network, being our wind instruments and everything over at the uh, helm station. Now this doesn't plug directly into our network here. You can see in here is a six pin. That's a six pin connector, okay. This one has a five pin. So there's a bit of difference there. But that is why they have this adapter cable available here to interface with any of their systems regardless of age. So this adapter here is five pin. This is six. And connects to the six pin right there. So the first thing we're gonna do is just connect these two pieces together screw them down, 
they have watertight gaskets, like O-rings inside and everything. And then this one. But this is going to go yeah. inside. We have to run this inside the cabinet first, but just to show you while it's out here and accessible, this one is just going to plug straight into this connector right there like that. Twist and lock. And, lock. and that way now it is connected to the CTOC system of the boat. So anything else connected to CTOC can now connect and, and basically communicate with the Axiom system. So now we're just going to take this plug and put it right on there. You see it just goes right on like that. Push it down, turn this, twist it, quarter turn and lock it, and that's it. This one is for interfacing to a number of optional transducers you might have for reading your depth, you know, the, the contour at the bottom, anything like that. There's several different options, but we'll be getting into that at a later date. So for now, we close that one up. This one is for interfacing with other MFDs, other displays, things like that that you might have on the boat so you can connect everything together. We're not going to deal with that one right now either. And this one is just specifically for putting a little micro SD card that has some of your programs, your charts, chips, anything like that. Now, the unit also has a built-in chart chip right here. So you can see it's behind this waterproof gasket. It's on the back of the unit, so it's not accessible after if it's installed unless you remove the unit, but you're never gonna really change that unless you really move around and change areas. This is a very wide area coverage here for Caribbean, South America, Central America, and everything else. So we're gonna cover that in like that and just leave it sealed. But we're still going to connect this, which is a remote card reader, because you see this is something that you open up and it has another card reading slot right oh, there. Nice. Okay. So that is so that you can hook up a secondary chip. And the reason we want to do that, well, you could just put in another area of charts and have everything all installed at once. But my old unit stores all of our old tracks, waypoints, everything like that on an SD card or micro SD chip. So we can take the one out of this one and put it in here, plug that into here. And then when we bring up the Raymarine display, or sorry, the Axiom display, it will actually come up with everything still intact all of my old tracks charts everything like that so it's a nice little addition so we got this in order to be able to do that now again this is meant to be installed you know it could be installed up here or a remote location anywhere you want within two meters of the the axiom display itself but we're just going to let it hang back here now because we're going to be changing all of this in the near future so for now i'm just going to plug it in so that it is plugged in and we'll have access to it just like so and that's it. Quarter turn, it's locked, it's watertight, it's good to go. Great. So that's ready, this is ready. All we need to do now is these, take these, these and feed them through here. And these are going. Okay, and then that is gonna come around the back side there. All right, so there's our okay, two cables. I connect, I connect. Now you can connect the C-Talk cable. Okay. Push it in turn. tight and turn it clockwise until it, it. until it clicks twice okay good that's good now this this is our power cable coming into the table so the power cable we just want to double check it first now this is an original power cable so ultimately at some point we're going to want to replace this but that's not going to be today either <laughs> so, so that's a big job but that'll be something when we actually replace the table we'll take this out and put in a new power cable and this this is one of the most important elements of cruising that you're going to want to have on your boat. This is something that, you know, if you're going to service or fix or diagnose anything, you're going to need a good multimeter. And there's lots of good ones on the market. Some of them are very expensive. Like I used to have the Fluke and it's very expensive. It was good. It lasted a long time. But we had to look for something a little bit more budget conscious when we went around this time. And this one I think was about 60 or $70. So far it works really good. It's a clamp on meter, so you can measure amperage for AC or DC cables just by running the wire you know, through there and clamping onto it and it'll tell you how much current is passing through that wire. That's good for checking how much current any of your loads are drawing inside the boat. It's good for checking your alternators. You can clamp right onto the alternator and see how much amperage it's drawing, you know, how much it's charging, make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be. And it comes with a very good assortment of you know, leads for different purposes. You are going to find that we're going to have a specific web page set up on our website that is going to be just for all the stuff that we use and recommend on the boat. So that'll be coming up in very near future as well. But hey, we got our hands full right now. There's only so much we can do, but keep an eye out for it. It will be coming. So basically, I just switched that to voltage. 
It's on volts now. We look and it says DC voltage right there. And we'll connect this to negative and this to the positive. And there, you can see we've got 13.03 volts. So we have good live voltage coming through, no resistance, any problems there. So that's good. We need a couple of connectors. We're gonna refresh these connections a little bit. I'm just gonna strip back a little bit of fresh wire just to get rid of, because these got a lot of old gummy electrical tape and stuff on them. Basically, we're just gonna use a couple, it's not heavy gauge wiring, so we just need some butt connectors, but a little bit heavier than that, so we'll go to the next size. We use one, two of these. And you see again, these are the heat shrink type connectors. So once you've crimped them on, you can actually use your heat source and melt that down and it will just seal itself around your wire. And then use this guy. And just like so. And there you see, we've got a perfectly clean piece of new wire at our disposal now. So we do the same thing with this one. Good set of crimpers, very important also. And as much pressure as you can put on it is good. So that is our basic connection. So we've got our CTOX system hooked up and our power circuit hooked up. Tighten those down. Okay. Good. And pull this off. Perfect. Now. That's it. Touch of the screen, swipe it to the right. You see the green light turned on. Axiom. We have power. We're in business. And it seriously was that easy, okay? So that's why I don't want you guys to get intimidated. We're not gonna do everything perfect right now, but we're gonna just walk you through the basic steps of what to look for, how to hook things up, and just plug it in, basically. But the important thing is to make sure you don't mix up your power connections, especially, because you can damage things by having the positive and negative reverse. So that's why, you know, I insist, this is one of your most important elements because for us, yes, the wires are black and red the way they're supposed to be. If you've had previous owners on your bow working on stuff and they put blue wires in or, you know, yellow or some stupid stuff, you don't know what it is, it pays to just check it and make sure what it is before you actually plug it in to your expensive electronic device because you don't want to damage this right off the start. So, yes, we're going to start it up. We got English selection. Uh, fishing, saltwater, motor cruising, sailing. sailing. Yeah. So, yes, sailing. Minimum safe depth. That's important because obviously we require at least two meters or six feet. So we'll just set that as our draft for now. We might want to set that to a different thing like 10 feet or something later, but we can change all that after the fact, I'm sure. So, uh, maximum safe height. That's if we need bridge clearance or anything. And our bridge clearance height is basically 65 feet. Not that I expect we're going to need this anytime in the near future, but there has been times I have needed to know, <laughs> whoops, how tall a bridge was if we were going to get under it. Because I've done a lot of in, you know inland locks and systems like that before. Don't expect to be doing those now. And the Welland, or sorry, the and the Panama Canal that we're gonna be going through, it has some bridges, but they have much more height than 65 feet. So I'm pretty sure we're gonna be good there. Minimum safe width. Our beam is 16 feet. Number fresh, fresh water, water tanks, one. we have no, two. two. Yes, too. Live well tanks, not sure that's no. for fishing boats. Well, they want to know this in case you have sensors that monitor the tanks, but we don't have sensors on all these tanks, okay. so programming this stuff in is kind of wasting time for us. We don't need okay. to deal with it. But you can see there's a lot of information that you can program if you want, and if you have all those sensors that are going to be hooked into it. Save and exit. Okay. Limitation on use, of course, this is their liability release, and if you fuck up, it's not our fault. <laughs> So you're not going to get anywhere without pushing oh, okay, we know that. Oh, now start the computer, the screen, with the everything. Charge, and now this is our main board. selection. Yeah, so, radar. Yeah, we don't have any of this hooked up yet. We don't have, you know, anything other than charts. We have no radar or depth sound or anything hooked up yet. That's in the future, but for now we're just on chart. So we're just going to have a look at chart. Yeah, I have the new chip. I forgot to put it in because we just spent a day and a half downloading all the new charts because the internet connection is not exactly fast here. And we had like five gigabytes of chart updates. So we do have it loaded now. I've got the chip downstairs. I'm going to go grab that and we'll swap it out on the one in the back. Okay. And we pop this open. 
remove the SD card. This is the new Navionics chip that I just updated all the charts for, so we're going to remove the micro SD. Put this, Give me this for the news. in the slot, like so, and close the waterproof gasket. Put that back in its place. And now we restart. Oh, you have to accept the responsibility yes. first, so hit OK. Sure. Waiting for satellite fix. Okay. Let's see. Well, that's a man overboard button, so if somebody falls overboard, one of the most difficult things at sea is to actually find somebody. Even within 10 seconds, if you're not pointing and watching them constantly, you'll never find them again, you know, on a, unless it's a perfectly calm day. And the same thing can happen if you happen at night, you'll never find him unless he's got a flashing beacon on. But if people are trained that as soon as somebody goes overboard, as quickly as possible, you push that button, it locks your position on the display. It memorizes the GPS location and it immediately charts you a course back to where the man went overboard. Wow. So it tells you how to get back to him. And a lot of times you can have it tied into your navigation system as well so that if you're sailing along, you can have a GPS beacon that will trigger the whole system when somebody falls over the, all the, uh, if they fall off the boat. They hit the water, their life jacket inflates, this little GPS beacon will activate, send a signal to the boat. The boat will go into man overboard procedure. It'll lock the display on his position. And if your engines are running, it will shut the engine down. I mean, you can have it do anything you want. There's some really cool stuff out there. I mean, I don't have that kind of stuff yet or within my capabilities, but we'll be investigating that in the near future because I think it'd be really neat to have that all tied together like that. It's very good for rescue, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And now you can see we've got our yeah. GPS position is plotted. So now hit chart. And now it takes us to where we are. Let's see what comes up. Apparently a lot of ocean. It's at a half mile radius, so I don't know. Wow. There we go. Oh, it's still just a base chart system. You can see there's our basic map outline, but we've got an issue with our chip, so we're going to have to figure that out next before we go any further. I'll be back. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Squarespace for coming on board to sponsor some of our SSL episodes. If you haven't heard of them, they are a full-featured website hosting, construction, and development platform. We had switched over to build our new SailingSophisticatedLady.com website on Squarespace about six months ago. You can see as we update our partners section that it is very intuitive and easy to find your way through. So if you are looking for new hosting or a place to build your new website, have a look at squarespace.com. Okay, so we did have a bit of an issue trying to figure out why I couldn't get a chart to read on it, but it turned out it wasn't an issue with the chart cards or anything else. It was just a setting that I didn't know about that is now in the main menu. I found it when I finally went into the manual and said, okay, we need to find out what the problem is. I assumed, like the older units, you would just plug in a chip with the charts and the device would start reading the chip. It would automatically switch over to the new charts. It's not the case with the new units. And what I had to do was go in because this allows you to customize many different applications for the same charts. So you have to tell it what you want it to read. So if I go into this chart menu here, I open up the chart app, you'll see it's just on the background maps. This is just the one that it's come stock with that are from Ray Marine. If I zoom in on our location, you'll see, you know, there's a five mile radius, there's no island, there's nothing there. It's because it doesn't have the level of detail that we need for what we're doing here. If I zoom back out now, you have to go into the settings menu, which is over here, scroll up and settings icon right there. So I push settings and the first thing on the settings, you've got layers, depth, cartography is the first setting. You see it's set as the default, to the lighthouse charts that come with the Raymarine device. You have to manually switch it over to the ones that you want because there's several different ones that you could be using that could be plugged in at the same time and it defaults to the original one until you tell it what you want to see on each app. So, all right, cool. 
took me a little while to figure out, but now I got it. <laughs> so we switch over to the Navionics nautical chart. And there, you instantly see, there's our full chart now. It shows all the outlines of every single map that it has loaded. And we can now zoom in on our location. And first you see that San Andres is coming up. You also see Providence up there. Yes, Catalina. So we keep zooming in, zooming in. And there is San Andres. Perfecto. Then we can zoom in further and you see exactly where we are, ah, right up in the anchorage. Yeah, Cotton key and us. Beautiful. So, perfect. So now we got that figured out. What I was saying earlier is now there are many different apps that utilize these chips, whichever one that you want to use, whatever cartography, whatever is installed. So you can switch to anything you want by just pushing the home button. So that's the one with the little home. Okay, that brings you back to your main menu all the time. Chart. So you can you can select if you just want chart, it takes you back to the chart. If you want dashboard, you can have several different instruments hooked up to it. You take it to this, and it will show you oh, wow. RPMs of the engine, you know, gear you're in, oil temperature, all of that. You can have anything hooked up to this thing. It's all it'll communicate with anything you want to hook up on the boat and monitor from the displays. So that's why if you want, you can have multiple of these displays and have them all displaying different things, different pieces of information, and it's all available through touchscreen. So this is if you just want to have sailing instruments. Obviously, we have no other instrumentation hooked up to it right now, so everything is just defaulted to no information. But you can switch it to anything you want. There's many different defaults there. So we switch back to home. Same thing here. You've got, if you want to have a chart and the dashboard combined, Chart audio, chart video. Yeah, there's many different combinations, but see, if we go to chart dashboard, now you have a mix of the dashboard and your chart on the side here, but again, you have to go in and tell it which one of the charts you want it to read, because you can have it default to just the lighthouse charts if you have something more extravagant plugged in for them. But yeah, if you guys would like to have more detailed information, a more thorough going through of the menus, how it programs, what is available, what you can do with it, then just let me know in the comments below and I'll look to do something like that. If you have a specific question about this device, how we're going to use it or how it integrates with something else on the boat, by all means, again, just leave a, a comment down below and we'll have a look. But for now, that is our basic setup. So we are in business here. We'll switch back to home screen and just back to chart and this is where we're going to reside most of the time right here there's a lot of different options you can program on the screen for the amount of information level that you want to have available and i've got it set so that even if you zoom out it shows you where all the charts are that are programmed in memory and when you zoom out that makes it look a little bit busy but it is with a purpose because sometimes there's little tiny charts out in the middle especially in the pacific and stuff like that where you wouldn't normally know that there's even an island there or a reef or anything, but if you have the chart outlines on, you can see just like this little one right here. You see that? That's a little tiny island that doesn't Malpelo. exist on the chart by its own. Yeah, and that's Malpelo. Malpelo. It's very famous for dive. And we've heard a lot about this little island. It's owned by Colombia in the Pacific. So how cool is that? That might be someplace we want to check out. Oh, uh, I don't know. It's full of hammer charts. Hammer charts? Yeah. <laughs> Well, so is Galapagos, they're famous for there. Yeah, it's better. But the same because it's a desert Italian. It's only famous for the dive. Yeah. They stop in this area and for one, for a few days. But is it a safe a anchorage or is it a rough anchorage? Like, is it a good place for overnight? With this, you need to ask to Jersey Jeff. Jersey Jeff. Oh, he's been to Mount Palo? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, well, I guess you're, uh, you got a question coming, Jersey Jeff, so feel free to answer. <laughs> But on that, yeah, any other questions you guys have, let us know and we'll see what we can do. For that, I think we will leave it and we will see you in the next episode because we got some more stuff coming up that uh, we'll talk about then. So have a good night, guys, and over good and weekend. out.
right, now, in getting back to the axiom itself, we're going to look on the back, and you're going to see, basically, we've got four big connection points on the back of it, okay? This one here is the only one, the primary, that we're looking for. Danny? What? <laughs> you need to stay at the same distance or the sound's going to be going in and out because your microphone's getting further and further away. So you can just come in here and just, if you want to use zoom or something, fine, but try and keep the microphone in the same position so the sound doesn't change. Okay. Because otherwise the sound, my voice is going to get very faint and then loud and faint and loud. So don't worry about that, it's okay. Just... Continue. 